Hey everyone, uh, today we have Harj Tegar. Uh, he is the CEO and co-founder of Triple Byte and a multiple time YC alum. So if you could just give us some of your backstory and uh, we can go from there. Cool, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so I first went through YC in 2007 with my first startup, Automatic, mm -hmm. where we were building uh, e-commerce software to make it easy for small businesses to sell online. I uh, then sort of a year and a half later, we sold that company I spent a year at our acquiring company and came back to work at YC as a partner in 2010, mm -hmm. back when YC was effectively just Paul and Jessica. Um, and then we sort of grew YC. Uh, I left YC in summer 2013, uh, took a bit of time out to travel and to work on personal projects, and then started Triple Byte with Guillaume and Armon, mm -hmm. who, were, who had also gone through YC with Social Cam in 2012. And their co-founder was Michael Seibel, who's now the CEO of Y Combinator. And the three of us kind of started brainstorming some ideas and decided we wanted to work on uh, Triple Byte mm -hmm. and went through YC in summer 2015. Okay. And what is Triple Byte? Just to clarify. Yeah. So <laughs> Triple, Triple Byte is, um, it's effectively a marketplace for connecting uh, software engineers with companies that are hiring. Mm -hmm. And specifically what we do is we put engineers through a evaluation process that tests their skills without using their resumes or their backgrounds. And what that lets us do is find really great engineers who might not make it past the resume screening step at mm -hmm. a lot of companies and conversely filter out engineers who do have great resumes but don't actually have a great technical ability and then we use that data to match them with the companies they'll be the best technical fit for. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of tell an engineer with a pretty high degree of accuracy, um, you know, they may be a really great fit for uh, Facebook, Dropbox and like three other companies that have a similar profile and what they're looking for mm -hmm. um, and not such a great fit for other companies. So hmm. we, can, we can help engineers sort of streamline their job search process and just speak to companies where they have a high chance of uh, kind of doing well. And where did that idea come from? Um, a few different angles. So my co-founder Armand had originally sort of had an idea around um, recruiting and specifically technical recruiting mm -hmm. being broken and just felt that um, it was a really hard problem. Each of us had experienced it at our previous startups, um, like how hard it was to hire. Right. Uh, yeah. And I had seen, I had seen coming out of sort of working at YC that as soon as every company raised their seed round, the number one thing they complained about was how difficult it was to hire. And so um, we kind of knew it was a real problem. We experienced it ourselves at our previous startups. Mm -hmm. um, it started with this idea of, well, if we started a recruiting firm to solve this, what would it look like? And we kind of started thinking about things that we found interesting about that idea. Mm -hmm. And the specific angle was this idea of data, that if you were a recruiting company that specialized not in spamming people on LinkedIn, but specialized in figuring out who was a great engineer and on the flip side, figuring out what every company was specifically looking for, you'd have like this amazing data set um, and you could just make it efficient on both sides. So you'd have people looking for a company spend less time like in wasted interviews and you'd boost the productivity of companies because they'd spend a lot less time interviewing people that weren't a good fit for them. And so how many engineers have you placed at this point? Uh, we're not public with the numbers and the oh, placement okay. stuff yeah, just yeah. yet, um, but we've had, we've had uh, about 15,000 go through our screening process at this okay. point. Cool. And um, I've seen you guys put out a bunch of content and stuff like, what are the traits that companies are looking for at this um, point? So we started out, so we, when initially when we launched, actually we were working with just YC startups. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've expanded to outside of that, but we're still predominantly focused on, I'd say sort of internet software companies. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that most of them are looking a, a trait that's most in demand is kind of what we call like the the product engineer, which means someone that um, someone that's able to uh, think about problems in terms of like how will this like you know help our users or grow our user base or boost revenue, as opposed to being attracted to just. Um, uh, interesting technical problems. Mm -hmm. um, another trait that's pretty common, actually this is like a shift that's going on I think in the hiring process for engineers in general, is looking for signs of coding productivity as opposed to theoretical knowledge. So okay. um, Stripe potential were sort of like a, a big proponent of this where interviews are shifting, technical interviews are shifting increasingly towards uh, here's a laptop, here's like a, a project and like debug the code or like show us you can build something in a couple of hours mm -hmm. as opposed to here's a whiteboard and like here's like 
show me how this like algorithm would work mm -hmm. um, kind of thing. So we, we're finding that actually knowing your tools well and being able to like productively write code during a during an interview or just show examples of being productive as an engineer as opposed to having a great base of theoretical knowledge is increasingly in demand. And so it's not even take home at this point, it's literally like spend a day, build something in companies, the office? Some companies do do take homes. The yeah. trade off with doing a take home project is um, you have a drop in the number of people that will go through it. So. Um, Specifically, often what happens is when someone decides they want to find uh, a new company to work at, mm -hmm. they'll apply to multiple companies, right? And mm -hmm. if you are the one company that has a take-home project and they have three other companies that they'll just do an on-site interview and get them through the process, mm -hmm. then m a lot of engineers will just choose not to spend the time doing your take-home project. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> conversely, it can actually help you find really great people because a lot of people don't perform well under a timed interview, but are really great, smart people, mm -hmm. and they actually can do better when you let them like work on a take home project when no one's watching them and um, they can actually show you what, what their like strengths are under that. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, cool. And so um, and if someone were to be looking at building that skill set, what would you recommend? Do you recommend people go to boot camps and do that stuff? Um, so boot camps, this is interesting. Boot camps are controversial because they a lot of tech companies have got a bad, have had bad experiences with boot camp grads and it can they can almost act as a negative signal. What we found is that the top like the top tier of bootcamp grads are on par, if not better, in certain dimensions than the top CS grads. Hmm. Um, and specific, this is getting a little anecdotal, but like specifically, what we tend to find is that people who have a an engineering background, like whether that's software engineering or maybe it was like just a form of engineering, but they like didn't go into programming. They like worked as an investment banker, say. Um, boot camps okay. can be really great for them because okay. they like they teach you like the exact tools that companies use and they teach you kind of like how to build web applications and you already have sort of the general principles of engineering as your as your base. And so you can come out of one of those pro programs and be like a, a top tier junior engineer. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't recommend a bootcamp to someone who's already been working as an engineer for a while. Okay. And if I say I'm a high school student, do I go to college and study CS or do I go to a bootcamp? Um, depends, depends what you want. I mean, I guess this is what I could like answer that in like a number of ways. I yeah. think like, if you were, it depends on the person I yeah. imagine, but if, yeah. you, if you're optimizing for like time to get your first job, a bootcamp, there's a strong argument for why like, you know, a bootcamp is three months of like intense pressure. Um, I, I think like the arguments for doing like a CS program, I, you know, apart from like just the social aspect of going to college and meeting people and just like kind of developing yourself um, would be not not all companies are only building web applications like there is there is um, there are a large number of companies that like highly value computer science knowledge and it does like it, you know arguably it does sort of help longer term having mm -hmm. like a, having a more fundamental <clears throat> underpinning mm -hmm. so um, it, it's kind of it's up to you but it's not as it's not as clearly obvious as maybe it was before that getting a CS degree is the only way into uh, engineering career. Fair enough. Um, so you are one of uh, increasingly more people now that have done YC multiple times. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you come in. Um, so you've done YC twice yep. now, uh, in addition to being a partner for several years. Yep. Uh, why did you decide to do YC a second time? Um, yeah, good question. So for us, there were, I think there were like two, there were two big reasons. One, we, we really were like very early stage with, with TripleByte in that we had the idea and sort of enthusiasm for the idea, but we didn't have a process type or anything. Um, uh, and this is, this is like just over a month out before the batch was even going to get, right? <laughs> yeah. And so um, what YC really helped us do was, it was like a forcing function and a deadline to just like get everything together and like be really focused and like make sure that we like just did the maximum amount we could mm. um, to kind of get something out there and launched mm -hmm. and um, that kind of just continued throughout the batch. Mm -hmm. um, another reason is we are, you know, our product, well, we're a marketplace, but like one side of that marketplace is technology companies. And so even though I kind of had a strong network from YC, both being a partner and having gone through it before, um, having like another like hundred or so companies that are in our batch, um, and you know, some of whom are going to go on and be like huge companies, like that, sure. that's like, like, that just helped a ton. Like, I, I think there's a really strong case where if you're like a B2B company, um, 
being part of a YC batch can just help a ton with getting your first set of customers and feedback in a sort of low risk way. And did you have any thoughts on like how fundraising was different the second time around? Um, th- I mean, there was just, there was such a, there was like a, an eight year gap between me going through YC, <laughs> right. right? And so <laughs> the whole like, environment. Yeah. yeah. So, so 2007 YC really looked, that, that demo day was just a group of people who were friends with Paul and Jessica um, and were mostly there to see if there might be some cool teams that they liked hanging out with and wanted to like write a small amount of money to. And as a company going through YC, you weren't expected to raise a big round. It was kind of like, a, well, if someone might, if you want to work on this as a company, that was the decision after three months, right? It wasn't, it wasn't like, how much money do you want to raise? It was like, am I going to go back to grad school or do I continue working on this yeah. thing and like try and build a real company around it? Um, and so it, it was like a very, very different environment. And in summer 15, that was completely rare. Oh, yeah. Like, no one at this point. It's very legit. Yeah. Now. yeah. Well, by summer 15, like, at this point, now YC has, like, the huge successes, right? So there's, like, <laughs> Airbnb and Dropbox, and people are, people are there, like, with, like, you know, some, some people have, like, moved away from their families for the three months. And so it's, like, a, it was a real we're in this like everyone like is there to build a really big company mm. um as opposed to like figuring out if they want to start a company at all what was it like doing office hours for the second time um it was uh so i think the biggest difference from the first time going through yc and the second okay well one the first time going through yc 2007 there weren't actually four more structured office hours so uh, it was just pg and yeah jessica. just pg and jessica so right. all all that happened is that you might occasionally get an email from them saying kind of how's everything <laughs> going and if you had something you ping them and said like hey like can we meet up and talk and so we actually did that um uh, when we went through YC in 2007. Mm-hmm. And so that actually, that format, that actually was pretty similar to like what one-on-one office hours look like today. Like they are, mm-hmm. they are mostly just a conversation where you bring the things you want to talk about and you get sort of high level advice about about them in like, you know, like 30, 30 35 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the big change was like the group office hours. Like, um, we didn't have that during 2007 and so and that was actually where most of our interaction with yc came through in the batch was the group office hours where you have like 10 or 12 other companies and sort of two or three yc partners and you kind of go around updating on what you got done over the last couple of weeks yeah um those were really useful for us actually because everyone was grouped we were grouped into um like the other, let's say, like enterprisey startups, and the good thing about that was all of us were going through kind of the same issues. Where enterprise mm. startups tend to not have as easy to like, it's not as easy as like ten percent week on week user growth yeah. because yeah. you're typically trying to get just like your first deal, and so the metrics that you have for like work are how many like companies have I spoken to, how much outbound have I done, and everyone's kind of in the same position doing the same thing. Mm. So th- there was like really useful advice that came out of that. Like, and how do you you best take advantage of your time like between meeting your batch mates and like setting up uh, relationships whether it's a deal or otherwise um you, you i think during yc you skew heavily towards the latter like you skew heavily towards um just work obviously yeah. right like you spend you don't actually i don't think you and i don't even think this is honestly the case during 2007 when there are only 11 companies in a batch the relationships i formed in 2007 um and some of those people are like really close friends of mine like even today like robbie walker is a part-time mm-hmm. uh, partner at yc now um and we didn't really get to know each other that well during the batch because everyone was just like working all the time right it's more like in the time afterwards as like you know we didn't like we got thrown out of our apartment and we didn't have a place to stay so we ended up staying with robbie in his apartment in like 2007 and like um and that still happens today like during the batch everyone is like heads down trying to build their thing the relationships tend to come um like post yc because then you're all going through the same sort of issues right like you're all trying to like hire your first person you're all trying to like figure out how do you manage like you're trying to figure out like like how do you scale and grow a company together cool and then what about the um the, the learnings you took from being a partner to then being in the batch again. Like okay. that, that's a very unique experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a unique experience. I think to some, okay, so here's what, here's what I think. Like I think during a YC batch as like a participant, it's really, really hard to not fight the temptation to feel competitive with everyone else in the yeah. batch. And yeah. generally um, there are always some percentage of people in the batch who are like, 
talking very loudly about like how amazing like they're just like doing tons of revenue they're just like every investor is desperate to invest in them and um i just knew from being like a partner for like several years that that like those the companies that talk the loudest during the batch doesn't correlate with anything right like <laughs> often the, like the really i don't know like you look at like an, an instacart or something like yeah. um like our Puma, the founder was just like really heads down building that company he wasn't really talking about like what he was doing during the batch um and so i kind of knew from like a logical and like high like overview perspective that that stuff really didn't matter mm. and like there weren't any sig none of the signals about who was doing well during a batch meant anything but um and i kind of like try to ex i think like maybe help other batch mates like just kind of understand that mm. um but yeah it is actually just like emotionally it's very hard because like it's like you know doing a startup is a stressful thing and most people who start a company have somewhat of a like competitive like streak or a desire to like push and like drive and be ambitious and mm -hmm. so you, you kind of can't there's a really strong impulse to feel like you need to be competing with other companies in the batch which doesn't help you in any way well that's one of the criticisms that i've seen go around where it's like people are essentially saying that like yc focuses on growth 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 during the summertime yeah um sometimes to the detriment of the product did you find that was the case at all with you um I have come across, and actually, like, even some of my, like, friends who are YC alumni have made that, like, same argument for not doing YC again, and I've always just found it, I've always found it somewhat nebulous, like, I don't see, I don't think that early on there is anything to optimize other than, like, growth, like, I think you have to, like, pick the right metric, and mm -hmm. so I, I agree that maybe early on, like, the right metric for everyone is not necessarily, like, revenue, right, like, it may be that the right metric early on is just, like, how many customers did you like how many potential customers did you talk to this week yeah and like you should be optimizing talking like if that's what you if that's the stage you're at as a company where you need to like do discovery and figure out if anyone wants your product then yeah you should like be growing the number of people you're talking to every <laughs> week right um because yeah. like that just means you're making progress quickly um mm -hmm. and so um i think yc focuses on like action and focus and if you have action and focus, the output of that should be a growth rate of something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, th I think for us, for example, we run like triple white is a business that is enterprise in the sense of we generate revenue when we place an engineer. Mm -hmm. The average time for someone like entering our funnel to like placed and being revenue uh, like for us is more like sort of like on the six to eight weeks end of the spectrum because people take a while to like interview and decide what they want to do mm -hmm. right and so going through yc for us i never felt pressurized in like the wrong direction like i felt pressurized to like why can't you speed this up like how many engineers are you screening per week that's ultimately like the metric that's going to drive this longer term mm -hmm. and that should be going up but mm -hmm. i didn't feel like it was like dumb advice in the sense of you should be growing your revenue even though it takes you like six to eight weeks to book a revenue and YC is a 12 month program, a 12 mm -hmm. week program, right? So. Um, Did you find yourself like trying to advise the startups in your group? Uh, like no. mid -best? No, actually that was, um, uh, actually it was something I like, generally try to avoid doing. Um, uh, I actually just didn't like, again, like YC creates like the, upside of like having a slight competitive streak i think is it does just push you to do more and like be really focused mm -hmm. and so um i i was like my head was like entirely consumed with just like how do we make sure like grow as much as possible in the next few months not mm -hmm. like how do i help the other companies in my batch <laughs> <laughs> fair enough do you remember your stats at the at the end of the batch <sighs> i'm not sure i think i'm trying to remember i think we were I can't remember the exact numbers to be honest. I think we were like probably around, I think we'd done maybe like 100K in or 150K in revenue mm -hmm. by the end of YC. Um, so like the absolute revenue numbers look pretty good because again, we're like enterprise in the sense of a low volume number of deals, i.e. placements, sure. but like each placement is quite valuable, which mm -hmm. is like just how enterprise deals tend to work. Um, and so kind of coming out of YC, our revenue numbers look pretty good for an idea we'd been working on like full time for 12 weeks. Mm. And then what about um, just general advice for people in your space? Like if I'm looking to find engineers, what, yeah. what do you do? Um, I mean, use triple bytes an obvious, yeah. uh, obvious thing. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. How do you guys find engineers? And then um, that's one of the questions. Yeah. And then like obviously use triple byte. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, so, okay, so yeah, sourcing engineers, like just getting is sort of like the first battle. Um, we, we're unusual in the in the respect that what's worked really well for Tripwire to source engineers has actually been um, 
a combination of just like writing sort of blog posts and content articles about mm-hmm. like what we've learned from doing all these screens. Um, and no one's really writing good quality content about how you run a technical interview, like how you make your decisions, what correlates with what companies are looking for. Mm. Um, so that that's helped us a ton. Um, I, actually, here's a kind of like one thing I'd say. Um, one thing that's really helped us our core product is effectively a technical hiring process and we've paid a lot of attention to making that be a good experience for everyone that's coming through and that's generated a lot of word of mouth in terms of other people say oh like this was a really great interviewing experience you should try it out i think companies can totally do that where if you if you take the time to give your candidates personalized feedback on how they did and suggest how they might improve Mm -hmm. uh, if you take the time to do that you can generate like word of mouth um in the sort of the engineering community as a good good place to go and interview hmm. um other 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 things i think early stage companies should mostly focus on referrals and trying to find people that they've worked with in the past or they have some signal on what they'd be like to work with mm-hmm. so you would totally early on you totally want to if you're making a trade-off between like aptitude and skills and ability to work well with someone early on you want to like lean towards like the latter because you know if there's only a few people it's okay like you'd rather take the person who might be slightly less skilled but you know you will work well together over like the person who's highly skilled but like you would like not look forward to coming into the office with yeah Um, and then what about if um if you're vetting someone remotely do you have any particular tips and we actually vet all of our candidates um remotely through google hangouts so we this actually works really well for us like you can google hangouts lets you like screen share you can let them use we let them use their own environment so they effectively what they do is they pick the language they pick their tools and we give them kind of the problems they need to work on and they just share their screen Mm -hmm. and so you can get like a real insight into not just how they solve problems but how familiar are they comfortable in their own environment and Mm -hmm. you you see them at their best um, Mm -hmm. and uh, I think that that's that actually that actually works really well, and if anything, it like helps remove the bias that you might have from meeting someone in person when you're trying to just figure out like their their skills. Mm, okay. Um, all right. So we have a random list of like counterpoints against doing YC a second <laughs> okay. time. Uh, I want to just hear your answers to some of these. Um, okay. So someone asked, uh, were you ever worried that doing YC a second time would be viewed as a sign of weakness to a VC? Um, no, not really. Like, because I think I had seen, I think really the only thing that matters in fundraising is having traction. And I just like continually saw that, like, being a YC partner, like, the companies that raised on the best terms were not the companies that had like necessarily the strongest fundraisers as their founders. Or, um, it was just like the companies that had like the product that was doing the best. So I cared a lot more about what's going to, what's going to give me the optimal chances of building something that has traction in the next six months. Um, more so than like what's a VC going to think about my decisions on how I run the company mm-hmm. um, and so yeah I wasn't that wasn't something that concerned me because I didn't if I have a product that's growing uh, they v- VCs really don't care about all the other stuff they just care about that yeah so do you think that um, actually your background didn't matter all that much at all um, it helps like the background having a, having like previous successes having a network these things like help get your like foot in the door um, mm. but honestly I think they can also like it, that can also like um, put you in a bad position where when you have like access to capital and investors and um, investors want to base invest in you based on like your like you know what you've done in the past as opposed to like what signs there are that what you're working on now is great you can like easily and i've seen like there's like a bunch of examples of this like you can easily raise too much money early on off the bat and like that just like pushes you in weird directions right it's just like so easy it's so easy for you to feel like you have a real company because you raise like 10 million bucks <laughs> and you have a vc on your board and you hire totally. a bunch of people but like a startup is just like not really real until it has like real users and real traction and real growth mm-hmm. and so um that's that's just like the only thing that and it, that's the number one lesson i learned from being a yc partner which is like everything else just is fake until you have like real traction so do what gets you traction i felt that yc was going to boost our chances of getting us traction mm-hmm. so um it was like the the right decision that's a really good do you have a, any advice for someone who's like a founder who maybe has done something successful in the past um to just kind of like check themselves and not go nuts. Yeah, and raise try money. and um, so I I think so between before um, before starting triple by it um, I so I, I took like quite a while to like figure out like what exactly was I wanted to do and I had friends who had 
in similar positions where they sold a company before, they had a strong network amongst the, the investor community and the Silicon Valley tech community, and they get stuck for like years, actually sometimes, like trying to figure out what they want to do. And the problem is that, um, well, one, you have this network of really smart people, and smart people can find like a hole in any idea, no matter how perfect it is. So like you constantly seek feedback from really smart people, and um, everyone pushes back on what you're working on, and so it's like kind of hard to find something um, that you know someone doesn't have a negative view on. And then the other thing is you end up optimizing for um, things that sound really great at like dinner parties and social events. Um, and so you end up on these like blue sky vanity projects, right? Like yeah. you end up like, oh, like I'm gonna cure cancer, which is like a very great noble goal, but like I have like no real idea of how I'm gonna do that. Um, and so I think ultimately, I think again, what YC like, helps with is because you have to focus on growth you the only way you get growth is by solving a real problem mm -hmm. and so it like gives you an environment to make sure you're not working on something that's made up and it's really easy to do that as a second time founder because investors really want to invest in your thing especially early on mm -hmm. people want to work for you you have like a strong network so you can just like kid yourself into feeling that you have a company when you just don't and so stepping back from that like pre YC the second time, how do you go about choosing something? Cause I, yeah, I know tons of people like exactly like you're talking about who just like vaguely are around there's, at this point. There's so many different ways to come up with um, like what you want to work on. I, I, I would like to answer this in somewhat of a meta way. I actually think the best way now, um, the best way to start a company is really not to explicitly want to start a company. Um, it's what we did and it's working out fine for us. And I think it's a totally viable path to starting a company. So like, Drew with Dropbox, for example, he knew he wanted to start a company before he knew what the company was. And so mm -hmm. he like he was trying to like he'd set himself these like frameworks for like what are the things that are important to me in the idea that I work on. And he set those up front. He was like, I want something that's got a clear business model. I got I want something that, you know, is like a hard technical product because I like working on hard technical problems. Mm -hmm. Um and like out of that frame through those lenses, he like assessed all the ideas he came up with and Dropbox was the one that like met all the the requirements. He was like, okay, I'm going to work on this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's kind of what we did with Triple Byte. Like we wanted something that we had personal experience with the problem, had a clear business model. And we felt that we had like a clear strategy on like what would be unique on the distribution side to get started. So mm -hmm. like, that's how we went about it. We were like, what are the criteria that are important for us in an idea? Let's filter all of our ideas against those. And when mm -hmm. we find one that's a match on everything, like we should just go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the better way, honestly, though, is to not be explicitly trying to start a company is to like think about what are just like areas or problems in the world that I think are like interesting and build really deep domain expertise. So, for example, let's just say you decide you do want to cure cancer, which is like it would be a huge benefit to society. Um, I don't think the way you go about that is like what startup could I start to cure cancer? <laughs> right. I think it's like I think it's like, sure. OK, well, like, do I understand biology well enough to make a first pass at this? No. OK, well, then should I go and invest a year or two in? And like going to grad school and studying biology or should I make friends with someone who's already got a PhD in biology and learn as much as I can from them mm -hmm. and maybe they will start a company with me like once I kind of understand the space well hmm. but I, um, I think that like building deep domain expertise in an area and then going into like uh, a startup is a is a better way to do it and so say you were to do that and like basically people around the valley at a certain point, we'll know your name, right? Yeah. So you have this interesting thing that happens, like people just try and like jump on the party yeah. bus or whatever. Um, how do you go about like finding new co-founders, building a new network at that point, and vetting people? Um, you, yeah, it's, it's there, there's like no right or wrong way to do this again, but I think okay, in terms of finding co-founders, you. You again want to lower the bar in the sense of you will just never find like I mean someone the analogy to like just dating and marriage potentially sure. right? like you're you're never going to find like the absolute perfect person across like every like criteria so um, I know I don't think there's any secret to this like again like ideally the best way to find a co-founder is not to really be explicitly looking for a co-founder it's just to have like a group of friends that you would start a company with um okay so taking a step back I remember at startup school a few years ago Phil um, Libin the Evernote founder. Mm -hmm. um, 
he, he sort of said this in a somewhat funny way, but I think it's practical advice, where he would say he claimed he was strategic over the last decade about everyone he made friends with. He'd only make friends with someone that was a potential co-founder. I don't think, you know, I think he was like, I don't think that's actually like practically, I don't think either you should do that or that's probably what he did. But um, that is the best way to find co-founders is to be working, at, working on a problem somewhere that you'd have close contact to people who have skills that are complementary to yours and just being like building building friendships with them over a period of time Mm -hmm. as opposed to be trying to like explicitly find co-founders but if you are in that position then i think you honestly you run it as just like a a funnel like you like run it you like go out and meet as many people as you possibly can you like make a first you make your best guess at like how many of these would i like to try working on a project with um and then of those how many would i like you know seriously consider trying like focus on just like one single project like how do we go from like dating multiple people <laughs> to like just being exclusive yeah and then seeing like how it, how it goes from there I, projects yeah <laughs> basically i just think you do okay. you, you run it as a process oh yeah no absolutely i find that that's by far the easiest way just simple projects start from there um okay kind of a random question then you uh took a sort of sabbatical between being a partner at yc and doing triple bite yeah how was that experience and did you go into it thinking like you were going to come out with a revelation of sorts or or what why did you yeah, do it possibly somewhat i think um I, I had two big motivations for wanting to just like take i guess a, a sabbatical and do travel in particular one is that i'd always wanted to take a year out between uh finishing high school and starting college to do a gap year which i, I don't know if that's the american term but in england it's a i think people know what it is okay, yeah right. um uh and i actually like started planning where i would go and what i would do um but like but I just knew my parents were going to be so like um, annoyed with me if I did it, and so um, <laughs> I like I, I actually like, yeah I, I didn't I went straight into college, yeah. um, and so I kind of always had a bit of this regret of I never like did like the backpacking travel experience, and I figured that like the older I got, like the less likely that was to ever happen. Mm-hmm. So I kind of always knew I wanted to do that at some point. So leaving YC seemed like a uh, that seemed like a good time to do it because doing a startup doesn't isn't like the best optimization for having long uninterrupted periods of time to travel. Um, and so, and then the other reason was YC was like a great vantage point into everything that's going on but in in terms of like finding something to focus and you to like work on Mm -hmm. can be a little bit of information overload so i kind of just like actually wanted to take a step back and get away from tech and startups and thinking about startup ideas and knowing what everyone else was working on because when you realize one one thing that like being an investor maybe and being a a yc partner in particular gives you is a realization into just how many people there are in the world working on startups and how (laughs) and how like no idea is unique right so i would find myself like i would find myself like this with like friends who were looking for startup ideas right they said oh i want to start like a digital loyalty card and i'd be like oh well you know there's like that's a really great idea that's a really interesting idea but there's like 20 other companies i just read 20 yc applications for this exact same idea Mm -hmm. right and so i think to some extent when trying to start a company um, like ignorance is bliss and this is partly the reason why first time founders often have so much success right is they're just completely unaware of how difficult what they're doing is Mm -hmm. and how many other people there are working on the exact same problem and they just don't care and go ahead and do it anyway and so um, I like the experience of just being removed from tech and startups um, and just kind of doing something I'd always like had as a life goal or dream um was just like you know just was good for me like personally hmm. and did you come back with any particular revelation uh no i think that was that was probably the disappointing right like, oh, like, yeah, uh, i was the same way when i traveled i was <laughs> yeah. like oh, I, guess, I guess i'm back <laughs> yeah no, it's, there's, there's definitely like that there's definitely that sort of like you know you read enough articles on the internet about yeah. like how traveling <laughs> solo like change your life and like i'm glad i did it and it was a useful experience but yeah. it, it wasn't like i had like deep meaningful revelations about like who i am that i didn't realize before cool All right, man. This has been great. Thanks for coming in. Awesome. Thanks for having me.